these buttons, I think, or these icons, uh, they, they became really familiar uh, quite a while ago. But I tell you, we see them all over the place. Uh, we see them on, uh, on screens, we see them on uh, old cassette players, we see them on uh, CD players, now on this digital media, but we see all these buttons, and we all just intuitively know by now you know, what they mean. We don't need words, there used to be words underneath each one, but they're so common, we know them, right? Left to right, they are? Uh, eject. Eject. Oh. Uh, record. Red record. Okay. Rewind. Start. Play. Pause. And that's four. Yeah, or skip next track, whichever. Yeah. Uh, the first two buttons that came out were just the play and the stop. And this was, you know, back in the 60s when there were real to real machines. And you know, several of you were like, oh yeah, I remember that. The real, the real machines, they need to have a button not only to move it, but to point in the direction you know, that the tape was spinning. That way we knew which reel to put where, the full one here and the empty one here, so it goes from full. So the, it pointed you know, in the right direction. But as we played, we had to have a way to stop. So we had to have stop. So they came up with you know, just a block for the stop. The problem that came up soon after was that when you push the stop button, you know, the, the, the playhead that contacted the ribbon, the tape going across, it would drop away from the ribbon. And what happened? It made a noise. It was like this choke. So you push stop and it was like, Koom. and people are like, well, I don't like the noise. So especially when they were recording things, they didn't like this choke in the middle of the recording. So somebody said, hey, we need we need something that's silent, that doesn't make a noise, but still stops. And so that's where they came up with the pause button. It's good to pause sometimes. You know, when, when, you, when you're on a roll, you're in a tense conversation, and you're ready to say something, and then you pause. It's good to pause. Or when you're rushing around a corner, you're, you're you're at full speed, you're driving around a corner, and then you realize, I should pause. It's good to pause, sometimes. Or when you've been going through a day, you haven't stopped, you haven't eaten, you haven't taken a break, you moved from one activity to another, you've talked to this person, you've gone here, you have this obligation, this meeting, this errand, and by the end of the day, you finally pause. It's good to pause. Pausing can keep us safe, Pausing can make us healthy. Pausing can refresh us and make us new. Pausing can also help our faith. The Bible is filled with so many places where people pause. It comes across in different ways. There, there's waiting, there's resting, there's pausing, there's stopping, there's taking a break. There's all kinds of different pauses that happen, but all the time people are pausing. The interesting thing is, rarely does somebody in the Bible pause because they decide to. Most often when they pause, it's because God says to. So if that's the case, if God is repeatedly and commonly telling people in different ways to, to just pause, why? Why does God tell us to pause? And what does pausing do to help us understand God's love, understand how to follow Jesus, understand how to walk in step with the Spirit? What does pausing do for our faith? There's perhaps no better place to go if we're talking about this than Psalm 46. I guarantee you know part of Psalm 46. You have heard at least two verses out of Psalm 46. I think the entire world has heard Psalm 46. There are some famous lines in there, but this, this psalm, if any psalm does, or any part of the Bible does, talks and instructs and helps us see what is it about pausing that can be so good for our faith. So, Psalm 46. Uh, we're going to read the whole thing so we have the whole uh, message in mind, but 
I want to start by reading the first verse all together. If you can't see that, you can see it in your bulletin. So we're going to read the first verse all together. And here we go. God is our refuge and strength. Always ready to help in times of trouble. See, I knew you'd heard this song before. <laughs> and we keep going. So we will not hear the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into sea. Let the oceans roar and fall. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. All right, let's keep going. I like this. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city, it cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's glory thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and taps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. So we got the first verse that we knew. We got the other one too. Be still and know that I am God. Uh, we're going to start with the first famous one, and we'll work our way down to the other famous one. But if we start with the beginning, uh, what's going on here? The whole soul is framed in this idea of God, you, the Lord is our refuge and our strength, ready to help, or however, whatever the words are, always ready to help in times of trouble. And then, it, it, and then it needs some reasons or some, some justification for that. Because I mean, that's a big claim, isn't it? God, you are my refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. That's a big deal. So the songwriter goes through and says, where does that actually happen? So the songwriter looks in several different places. First section starts with, with sort of out there in the world. And talks about you know, natural disasters, earthquakes, roaring, raging, foaming waves, all these places where these big, crazy, wild, out of control things happen. And the point is to say, whatever is out there, God still remains bigger. No matter how out of control it seems or how scared we might be of it, God is still stronger in that. Well, then it goes to the next section, and the next section sort of zooms into a specific place. Rather than, you know, out there in the natural world, it, it comes close. And it's focusing in on what seems to be Jerusalem, this, the city of God, the place where the temple was, where God dwells. And, and it says, well, what happens if people are, are attacking that place? What will God do? How strong is God? And again, the question comes up, God, can you be our refuge and strength even in this place where there's all this chaos happening from the outside, but will you protect the place that is as much yours as anywhere is? And the point of it is to say, yes, God can even protect the most important place they understood for God to be. Even God can do that. And then the, the third seems to go back out there, but it's not just the natural world, it's into like nations and, and wars and, and, and strife between nations to say, are the wars too big for God to handle? Can God still be a safe place for you and me in those war-torn, challenging, messy areas of the world and life? And the point is to say, yes, God can still be our refuge and our strength even there. And, and it's, it's like there's, there's this huge contrast between these different places, natural world out there and close to home where some of these people might have been, and then out there in the world and the nations again. Can God really be our refuge and strength in all those places? As we're in the middle of the world we live in, the chaos we live in, the challenges we live in, the same question comes up. Can God be our refuge? and our strength. And the soul seems to be able to say, when the earthquakes come, 
in Syria and Turkey, when the tsunamis happen across the oceans, when our own country is challenged by natural things that happen, can God be big enough? And then it jumps you know, to, to another nation, and another uh, the nations of the world in that third section. Can God really heal the war in Ukraine that we've continue to pray for, and so many others are. Can God heal the nation, the international strife that's going on? In that second section, though, it poses the same question right around God's space, the place where God lives, the special place where they understood God to be. God, close to home, can you really be my refuge and strength with the things that we pray for, for each other, the family, the friends, the things happening closest to us, can God be our refuge and our strength? And the soul writer says, yes, God can be our refuge and strength. But the soul writer says, it's not where God can be our refuge and strength. It's who is our refuge and our strength. It's not a place, it's a person. God is our refuge and strength. The Lord is here among us, God is our fortress. Again, the Lord is here among us, God is our fortress. No matter where we are, no matter where anybody is in the world, no matter what is happening, Psalm 46 says and claims God can be our safe place. God can be the one who is bigger than whatever it is that's happening. No matter how true that may be, is that easy to say? Sometimes it is. Sometimes we have that confidence, we have that, that, that energy, that drive, that surety to say, yeah, God is my refuge and strength, and I know it. But we also know there are other times and other days and other seasons when it's not so easy to say that. We, we lack the confidence, or we lack the surety, we lack the, I'm just, I, I'm just not sure. I don't see it. And so I want to say it, but it's hard to say. So how does the psalm help us be able to say that God is our refuge and strength in anything? Because it lists off all kinds of things, and there is a person actually writing the psalm, a person who's convinced and convicted that this is true. I mean, was the psalm writer just having a good day? Where they just have it like, you know, they woke up and they're like, yeah, I feel better today. And God can do this. I think there's more to it than that. It's not just what we ate for breakfast or we woke up on the wrong right side of the bed or the weather looks good today, so I'm going to be confident in God. There's something more to it about how can we be strong in our faith as if to say, God is my refuge and strength, no matter what is happening. There are a bunch of different things going on in this song. We could group them into two groups. One group would be a lot of statements and claims and descriptions that happen. There are a lot of statements and claims and descriptions throughout this song. Things that are said. So there are statements about God, like God is this, uh, God dwells, uh, God, God rescues, God, uh, God solves. God does these things. Those are statements. Um, there are claims like God is this, or God dwells, or God is this kind of a God. Uh, then there are lots of descriptions like where these things happen and what is happening in different places. <coughs> but then there's one line in the soul that's different than all the others. It's not a statement, it's not a claim, it's not a description. It's the one line that God speaks. It's in quotation marks, it's the words that God speaks to give confidence and give encouragement to us, to the soul writer. Be still and know that I am God. Now if you were still, just picture yourself for a minute, if you were still and you were knowing that God is God, just picture where you would be. Just imagine, where would I be if I'm still and I know that God is God? Oftentimes we think of uh, someplace serene, someplace beautiful, someplace inspiring, 
um, our favorite beach spot, our favorite campground, our, our favorite place to go travel, uh, our, our own backyard, some place that is quiet. Imagine what's happening around you if you are still and you are knowing that God is God. I'm still and I know that God is God. What is happening around you? I think we often imagine that things are quiet, that things are still, that things are in order, that things are peaceful. What's happening to the psalmist, the soul writer, when the soul writer is writing this? Is it peaceful and quiet? Is it, is it serene and a, maybe a beautiful place? seem to happen that way. I mean, he's in utter chaos. He's in the middle of natural disasters. He's in the middle of wars. He's scared because people are attacking. He's wondering, how is this all going to get resolved? I mean, it is a mess that the soul renders in the middle of. And in the middle of that, God speaks, be still, and know that I am God. When God says, be still, it literally means Yield, let go, or surrender. It means to stop trying to do and trying to handle and trying to control and let go or yield. But like when you come up to a four way stop sign and you come up at the same time as another car, what do you do? You've got to do the no, no, you don't. <laughs> you, 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 we yield, hopefully, to the other vehicle. Well, what do we do when we go to the grocery store checkout line at the same time as another cart? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> we, we yield. We let somebody go. To be still is to let God go first to surrender to God taking the first step. It is not just stop. There's nowhere in the definition of be still that says stop and do nothing. It is yielding and actively letting go and surrendering so that somebody else can go first. There is more, though. I just lost this, didn't I? Okay. There is... There is more, though, than God just saying, be still. The rest of the verse is, and know that I am God. This brings up a really quirky thing about the Hebrew language. Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The, the Hebrew language, whenever there are two verbs right next to each other, it's not the first one that gets the emphasis. It's the second one that's the point. So, for example, if I said, uh, I got up and I ran to Dutch Bros, if the point isn't that I got up. It's necessary to get up, but the point is, I ran. That's what I want to tell you about. Because I want to tell you that I went to get my Dutch cocoa or my favorite lemonade or whatever it is. I got up and I ran. It doesn't matter that I got up. I mean, it does. But the point is that I ran there. It's the second action that matters. Be still and know that I am God. Being still is absolutely necessary. It's critical, but it's not the point. It's in order to know that God is God. God. As we're still, as we yield and surrender and let go so that God can go first, in that stillness, we get to know that God is God. That's a way of understanding and knowing who God is, what God can do in my mess, in the chaos of the world, in the things happening. That's how I know that God is God, by yielding and letting God go first. 
So if we, if we try to put this in some of our own language, we might say pause so that we can discover more about God. Pause does not mean we're stopped. Pause is a different button. Pause says, I'm waiting, and I'm going to keep going, but I'm waiting for God to come first so that I can know what God is doing and I can discover more about God. How do we pause? Because most of the time, uh, we want to go forward. We want to accomplish it. We want to make it happen. We want to be on our own. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to say, I can do this. I'm intelligent. I'm trained. I'm experienced. I've done this before. I know how this is going to go. I'm just going to do it. How do we pause when we're so used to being self-sufficient, getting it done, and making it happen? Well, we... A lot of things we always talk about. Stay, we stay connected to God. We, we, we worship together. We, we, we are here worshiping and understanding and learning more about God. As, as we worship, we so often pause. We sing, we pray, we do things that put God in front of us as if to say, God, God you go first. We, we learn about God. We, we study the Bible. We read the Bible. We pray together. We do things that put God first and help us understand what we're learning God. We stay connected to each other. We learn how each other handles life. We hear from each other about well, how do you deal with this? And where is God in the middle of what you're dealing with? We stay connected to each other. Uh, and some of the things we're talking about during the Lent season, we're taking some risks. We're trying some new things. We're doing things differently than we normally do. We're taking some risks. And in those risks, we understand more about who God is. One of the wild ways that people in the Old Testament paused was what we're doing here today, the season that we're starting, this season of Lent. They, they did these two quirky things. They, they put on sackcloth, and they put ashes on their heads and their bodies. They actually spread the ashes around them oftentimes and sat in the ashes. And the craziest thing about this whole thing is you know, to put on itchy clothing and to put on dirty stuff all over your body. They wouldn't just go in their closet, shut the door, and do this stuff. There are so many examples in the Bible of them doing it in public. Like they would go to the street corner and they'd be like, I'm a mess. I need to pause to let God go first. And they'd sit there on the sidewalk with ashes all around them in these itchy clothes. And people would be like, I know what's going on with you. I mean, it was so public. It, they realized, wow, I need to do this because this is a huge deal. We're not going to sit in our ashes and we're not going to put on sackcloth clothes, but we have a chance to be marked with a cross of ashes on our foreheads today as a sign that we are pausing to let God lead us and to let God be the one who helps us deal with our sin through the forgiveness of Jesus. So I, in, in a few minutes, um, we're going we're gonna to pray, and I invite you, if you would like to have ashes placed on your forehead, um, you're welcome to come forward, and I'll do that right up here. But let's pray together.